Okay, and is the room still spinning? Yes. Okay, so look at me. And then look all the way to the left. Absolutely magnificent. Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for another clinical skills video today. Unfortunately, we're filming from my kitchen again because well, I found out there was a problem with the audio that was recorded. So you'll have to uh, bear with me for the slight change in scenery. Today, we're going to be looking at the HINTS examination. With that, we're going to discuss what the HINTS test actually is. We're going to go over a few examples and explain why this test is such an important clinical test. And then we're going to walk through a, a demonstration of the examination with one of the students. So the HINTS examination is actually a series of tests. The head impulse test, the test of nystagmus, and the test of vertical skew. Collectively, these are termed the HINTS examination and are used to determine whether a patient with constant vertigo and spontaneous nystagmus has their presentation as a result of a peripheral lesion. So that being something like vestibular neuronitis or whether it's a much more serious concerning central lesion, which may be due to a stroke. At this point, let me be exceptionally clear. The HINTS examination should only ever be performed on a patient that has prolonged vertigo, lasting hours to days, and continuous, sustained, spontaneous nystagmus, and without any other signs in keeping with the stroke, such as being fast positive, having a facial uh, weakness, having weakness to the arms, and slurring of the speech. Now, vertigo is a very common presentation in the UK. In fact, up to 3% of the population are annually affected, hence why the HINTS examination is a very useful tool for assessing patients presenting with that constant vertigo and nystagmus to determine where the source of their symptoms are. And you're going to see this reiterated quite a lot in this video, that the HINTS examination must only be in patients with constant vertigo and spontaneous nystagmus. So before we go any further, we've talked about central lesions and we've talked about peripheral lesions. Let's just go over what exactly we mean by those. So common peripheral causes of vertigo include vestibular neuritis, uh, essentially an inflammation or irritation of cranial nerve 7, or we can also have it due to labyrinthitis, when there is hearing loss or tinnitus along with the vertigo and nystagmus. Another possible peripheral cause is Meniere's, but that's less common and tends to present with repeated bouts of vertigo accompanied by hearing loss and tinnitus. Now, by comparison, the central causes of prolonged vertigo and spontaneous nystagmus are much more sinister. They will be talking about posterior circulation or cerebellar strokes and other rarer causes such as brain tumours, multiple sclerosis, or potentially trauma. So let's go through a simple example at this stage. A patient comes into their GP after waking with severe nausea and vertigo that's lasted several hours. And when we look at them, in their eyes we see spontaneous nystagmus. Their eyes are beating. So the patient has our cardinal criteria for the HINTS examination. They have the spontaneous nystagmus and they have the prolonged vertigo. During the examination, where we're looking for any feature suggestive of a central cause of vertigo and nystagmus, in order to be able to refute a central lesion, we're looking for a strict criteria where we can identify all features of a peripheral lesion. So what are these features? If we're looking at a central cause, we'd be looking at anything from the list of a bidirectional nystagmus, a vertical skew deviation, and a normal head impulse test. Again, that's any of those symptoms would make us worry about a central cause. Conversely, for a peripheral lesion, such as vestibular neuronitis, we could only make that diagnosis if the patient had all of the following symptoms. So unidirectional nystagmus, no vertical skew deviation, and an abnormal head impulse test. 
Now, it seems a little bit paradoxical and may even confusing when we say that an abnormal uh, head impulse test is a reassuring finding. Well, that's because here we've identified a, a peripheral lesion, a vestibular neuronitis, okay? and this sort of thing would never be seen in a patient with a posterior stroke. So whilst we're not saying they have no problems, we're saying that they have no acutely worrying things, certainly nothing that is time dependent as is the case in a stroke. So our first patient has all of the peripheral features, so we'd give them the label of a hence peripheral, hence our vestibular neuronitis. To repeat, if a patient has no central features and all of the peripheral features, we can be confident that the patient's new onset vertigo and nystagmus is due to a peripheral lesion and thus that patient can be discharged home. Now, I say we're confident they can be discharged home. Exactly how confident are we? Well, actually quite. Uh, the research into the HINTS examination is very, very strong. So remembering that we have only a select group of patients that we can perform the HINTS examinations on, those with continuous vertigo and spontaneous nystagmus. Assuming we're using the correct patients, then the HINTS examination has a 99% sensitivity and a 97% specificity for central causes of vertigo. To put it in a slightly different language, 99% of the time the HINTS examination will identify a stroke correctly and 97% of the time it will also correctly rule out the presence of a stroke. So let's look at another patient. Between 2019 and 2020, there were 16 million patients attended A&E in the UK. And of those, 2% presented with vertigo. So that's some 300,000 presentations, making vertigo a very common and very important case study for both medical students and junior doctors. So let's talk about an inappropriate use of the HINTS test and where we can have a problem. So our patient is presented to the A&E department and they have abrupt onset short episodes of vertigo, lasting about 30 seconds each. And they've found that these are also brought on by changing position, say rolling uh, over in bed or getting out uh, of bed to a standing position. And it's accompanied with nausea and vomiting. Now, in many cases like this, those that I've seen, the patients often attend to the A&E department worried they're having a stroke. And at first glance, they might initially seem like a candidate for the HINTS examination. However, they're not. They lack the prolonged vertigo of hours to days and the spontaneous or gaze-evoked nystagmus. So in our example, if we went on to perform the Dixie Hallpike examination, as we've done in other videos, we might generate nystagmus there. And that nystagmus would specifically be a rotational nystagmus, perhaps with a small vertical uptick with each roll of the eye. And that nystagmus would probably last about 15 seconds or so. But again, we need to make sure that we don't confuse this with spontaneous nystagmus. We have had to generate it by doing the Dixie Hallpike. Thus, we shouldn't be doing the HINTS examination here. In this example, the patient has probably the most common cause of vertigo, that being benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And we would treat that by giving the patient the Epley's maneuver, which they could do at home. Now, with that in mind, given we can manage the patient without any investigations for anything further, let's highlight the problem if we did the um, HINTS test. Remember that in order to have a central lesion, we've got to have um, a bidirectional nystagmus, we've got to have a positive uh, sk uh, deviation skew, and we've got to have a negative or normal head impulse test. With a peripheral lesion, we need to have all of the features, so unidirectional nystagmus, no vertical skew deviation, and an abnormal head impulse test. So why shouldn't we perform the HINTS exam on our example patient? Just to check, to make sure, because if we did, then here the patient would not have bidirectional nystagmus, seems okay. They wouldn't have vertical skew deviation, still fine with that but they would have a normal head impulse test. 
which means they've scored one in terms of our central lesions. So suddenly we've got an erroneous diagnosis of a stroke and we need to start them doing a workup and potentially managing them at this point inappropriately. So we don't want to apply the HINTS examination to the wrong people because it will literally cause harm if only the distress of a suspected stroke, which is not the case. Now, obviously, if a patient comes into the A&E department with vertical and nystagmus and they're presenting with any of the FAST cardinal stroke syndrome symptoms, so facial drooping, arm weakness or speech difficulties, or heck, even if they've got any other new onset neurological features that might suggest a posterior circulation stroke, so paresthesia, dysarthria, diplopia, dysphagia, dysmetria, it's all the Ds, uh, dysphonia and an inability to walk in aided, you're going to treat that patient for a stroke no matter what you find on the HINTS examination. So we need to use this test appropriately and also remember to, for want of a better phrase, also use our brains. Now today I do have a slight difficulty in that I don't have a willing stroke patient on hand to film with. Instead, we're going to go back in time with the power of technology to demonstrate the HINTS test on one of the students. And with that, we will highlight yet again why performing the HINTS exam on a person without continuous vertigo and spontaneous nystagmus is going to cause a problem. But I'm also going to be able to interspace this uh, video with sample footage that's just been provided by Dr. Peter Johns of Ottawa University. So, Props to him for helping out with this. So obviously with all patients, but particularly so here, because I'm going to be putting my hands on um, his face and head, make sure that we've gelled our hands. Uh, so in terms of doing this examination, um, I'm going to be looking at your eyes. I'm going to put my hands either side of your head and get you to do some movements and then get you to do some movements with your eyes. Is that okay? Yep. So before we go any further, could you please confirm your name and date of birth? Super. So to start off, if I could get you to take your glasses off, please. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look if there's any abnormal movements of your eyes. So keep your head still and look all the way to the left for me. And I can't see any problems there. Return to centre. Thank you. And then if you could look all the way to the right. Okay, that's fine. Again, we've confirmed there's still no nystagmus. That's very reassuring. Sometimes by having you focus on something that can suppress the nystagmus. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put some paper beside you and if you could look all the way to the left for me. Okay, and then we're going to do the same again on the opposite side, all the way to the right. Okay. okay. I'm just going to put my hands both sides of your head. Okay. So try and relax your neck, so let me move your head. Super. Now keep your eyes fixed on mine. Okay, and I'm going to move your head, and at one point I'm going to do a short, sharp movement. There we go. Super, that's it. Keep your eyes fixed on mine. Okay, so what we're looking for is we've done this. If there's any signs of nystagmus, now A, there isn't nystagmus, but if there was, if it came out and then came back in, so coming from the peripheral to the central, so a corrective saccade. So there's certainly no um, signs of a problem with a uh, head impulse test. So your eyes haven't um, lagged as you've uh, looked forwards. So your eyes have stayed fixed on mine all the way through. The final thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to put a hand over one of your eyes. I want you to keep looking in my eyes as I do that and try not to let your eyes move. Okay, and your eyes are staying fixed on mine. I'm, just, I'm going to quickly swap over and your eye on the opposite side hasn't changed. Same again. Good. So as I'm quickly covering and uncovering your eyes, your eyes stayed fixed on mine and there was no vertical movement of your eyes, confirming that we don't have any issues here. So we have a completely normal HINTS exam for yourself. However, there was no nystagmus and no vertigo in the first place, so we don't need to worry about that result. So in the examination we've just done, we've not seen 
any nystagmus. So the examination should not have proceeded. Normal people, such as our student, have a normal head impulse test, obviously. And normal people also aren't having stroke. So this is why it's important that we only perform the HINTS examination on people with significant vertigo and spontaneous or gaze of oat nystagmus. Because a stroke will have a normal head impulse test and a normal person will also have a normal head impulse test. So again, we're running that risk of giving false, very worrying diagnoses. In terms of uh, getting feedback on the HINTS examination, I've actually read quite a few patient reports that can get a little bit confusing as people using terms like HINTS positive and HINTS negative. So let's try clarify that right now. If you do correctly perform the HINTS examination on a patient and find features in keeping with the stroke, we should document that as HINTS central and also highlight what the features it was that we found. Conversely, if our HINTS examination, again correctly performed, shows a peripheral lesion, we want to make sure that's documented as HINTS peripheral and highlight all of the features that were there to correctly exclude a central cause of the vertigo and nystagmus. Unfortunately, I don't have any footage of a patient with nystagmus. Now we can take that as a positive, that uh, we haven't seen any patients recently who've been that unwell, but uh, we have decided we're going to try and torture Thava here briefly. So what we're going to do is we're going to spin him on the chair and that will move the perilymphatic um, fluid in his ear and will hopefully give us a normal and benign nystagmus so that we can see what we'd be dealing with in a patient that had a peripheral lesion. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> So look all the way to that side, and then all the way back to the other, and back all the way this way. Super. So that pretty much wraps up this video on the HINTS examination. Again, the core point that I've put all the way through this video is don't use this examination in people without prolonged vertigo and nystagmus. A patient only needs one clinical feature to be classified as HINT central, yet needs all of our diagnostic points to be classified as HINT peripheral. I'd like yet again to thank Dr. Peter Johns for supplying his advice in uh, constructing this video and the clinical videos that we've included here. You can check out his channel where he's got uh, more videos dealing with vertigo and uh, dizziness in the link down below in the description. Okay, and is the room still spinning? Yes. Okay, so look at me. Okay, and then look all the way to the... Absolutely magnificent.